Good morning. Welcome to our second weekly session on American government for BSC 121 uh, for the J term. Uh, a couple things. Hope you all had a good weekend and kept up with studies. Uh, a few things I want to mention that are important uh, assignments coming up. Uh, as we know, this class has a civic engagement component, and that assignment is due on the 24th of January. Uh, instructions are posted and we'll in on the specifics of it. And keep in mind, if you're already involved in a sport activity or community activity, uh, you can use that. If not, uh, find a organization, a group, either in Newberry or in the city where you live, and make arrangements to do the paper based on those things. If you have questions about the civic engagement assignment, please let me know. The final exam will be given on the 26th of January, and it will be posted at 9 o'clock in the morning local time. It'll be open for two hours for you to go in, write your essay, and then post it uh, through Turnitin. I require on all written assignments, so this will do with civic engagement as well as your exam, an honor statement at the end of this uh, essay that says that you use no other sources, you uh, work as your own, uh, basically follow this idea that uh, all you work is your own and you didn't copy it or borrow it from somebody else. If you're going to be using endnotes, footnotes, bibliography, I have guidelines posted uh, to resources on Wolfden, which provide some basics. I have no preference as to which format you use for citations, as long as you use one and use it accurately. So those are available on there to do. So again, on the 24th, your civic engagement paper is due, and on the 26th, so the final exam will be posted in the morning, uh, and you'll have two hours to complete it uh, once it's been posted and resubmitted via uh, Turnitin. Uh, I've had a couple indicate they may have challenges doing it on the morning of the 26th. Uh, if you do have such a challenge, let me know, and I can make other arrangements uh, to open it at a time more convenient for you, but still with a two-hour uh, time limit go forward. Uh, the second issue going on is the first discussion forms. Most of you have completed it, a few are still have not done the first one. Um, and keep in mind, these discussion forms are supposed to be a substitute uh, for class discussion and class interaction. And so part of your grade is based on your participation in the discussion forms, not only the ones that you write, but the ones your other fellow students wrote, and you have a response for. Uh, on the basic format uh, of the exam, of the, excuse me, of the discussion form, there was a bit of confusion on a lot of you on the distinction between natural law, the contract theory of law. Uh, the idea of too strong a central government is pretty, pretty consistent across the board. So the best way to look at the relationship between natural law and the contract theory is the contract theory is the implementation strategy. <clears throat> we know from the Declaration of Independence that says all men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator and certain unalienable rights, among them life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. The very next line says to secure these rights, governments are formed. So part of the government is to help adjudicate these challenges to natural law uh, because they understood left to our own devices, we humans have a tendency to be motivated by self-interest. The contract, contract theory of government basically says that in order to have a more civil society, we willingly give up part of our rights, part of our privileges that are guaranteed under natural law uh, for the betterment of society as a whole. So for instance, as we talked the first day, I have a right to put a shooting range in my backyard. It's my property. I can do with it what I want. The problem is, do we really want people having a shooting range next to a kindergarten school, a middle school, or a park, or another gathering place? So you willingly give up that right to have a shooting range in your yard because it's better for society, and government becomes the arbiter of that. Similarly with uh, somebody who wants to put a nuclear waste dump in their backyard, or build a building that's not consistent with the community in which they live. All these kind of things are rights we willingly give up because as we said month, uh, last week as well, uh, your right to throw your fist ends in my face. And if we don't have some consistent way uh, to willingly give things up, then we have problems if I demand my rights. So you see that in the issue of smoking. Uh, does a person have a right to smoke? Absolutely. Do I have the right not to breathe secondhand smoke and affect my health? Absolutely. So how do we balance those? And that's a place where government comes in to become arbiter of the situation. The other thing is important to keep in mind when we talk about these things is the difference between government and politics. 
Government is implementation of the policies put forth by our legislators, by our elected officials. And oftentimes, a lot of the debates and the challenges that come about have to do with the political squabbles, the political debates between individual elected officials and parties. And that becomes a real challenge because oftentimes what comes out in legislation is somewhat ambiguous, which then doesn't really tell the government bureaucrats who have to implement the program exactly what the expectations are and the outcomes are. So those are challenges that are in there. So that's why this whole debate over rights, over gun rights, over smoking rights, over health care rights, uh, over voting rights, all these things, we have to be able to compromise and work together in order to have a civil society. So we have to, as citizens, be willing to give up those rights. And we look at government as being the arbiter or the political process as being the arbiter of which one of those rights we have to give up. So critically important. So again, the natural outcome and implementation strategy for the whole idea of natural law is this idea that we willingly give up certain of our rights for the betterment of society as a whole. Important distinction, and a lot of you uh, missed that point when you did your, 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 your comments. The second is having a response to say, I agree, is not a response. In my class, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, and I don't grade on opinion. However, you have to defend your, defend your opinion. Why did you agree with them? Why did you think they were right? If you disagreed, why did you disagree? And be specific about those things. As we talked about the first day, I don't have number of words or or length and things like that in mind because I don't grade by the word. I grade by the quality of the content of what you write. But what you're writing has to do is reflect your knowledge and understanding of the question being asked. And that means the short answer, yes, I agree, is not gonna be sufficient. I wouldn't allow that if you were sitting in my class and I don't allow that on discussion forms. The important thing to keep in mind in all of my classes is I grade also on improvement. So if you did a very poor job on the first discussion form, and you improve and do better quality on the remainders, uh, then your grade will be less impacted by a poor first performance. Uh, but that's up to you. If you have questions specifically about how we want to deal with and handle the uh, discussion forums, please let me know. I'll be glad to answer those questions. Uh, I check email at least once a day, uh, more, more often than that on a normal basis. Uh, but let me know your questions and your help. As I've said the first day, I would like you to be as successful as you want to be. However, you have to let me know how successful that you want to be. Again, pay attention to those discussion forums. They are our substitute for classroom discussion. And the quality of your input on discussion form uh, is a, a measure of your interest, your understanding, and your active participation, and it is part of the grading scheme. So make sure we pay attention to those. Um, Okay, we talked about that, ready. Well, I have posted uh, PowerPoint presentations and hopefully they're helping out with your readings uh, for next week's readings they have already been posted in resources on Wolfden. Uh, so have a look, see, read through them as you go, as you move forward with what you do. I think that covers kind of the administrivia. Um, the topics we're talking about this week are the branches of government, Congress, the president and courts and the judicial system. And as you go through your reading, keep in mind those two basic premises we talked about. One is that government derives its just power from the people. And second, the fear of too strong a central government. All of these responsibilities and duties of these three branches of government are spelled out in the Constitution. It probably would be a good idea for you to read through those. Your text does talk about them in a great deal of detail, but have that as a resource to back up as you go through your readings. It's very specific. And what we see as we go through these things is the challenge and the debates uh, that occurred during the debates over ratification of the Constitution, over how strong we wanted central government to be. One of the first things that was done to try to eliminate too much power uh, concentrated in the central government is having balance of power, checks and balances, if you will. So we have three branches of government, the Congress, the presidency, and the judicial system. And each has a check on what the other one does. The president has a check on Congress because the president can veto. The courts have a check on both the president and the Congress because of its ability to declare things to judicial review as being unconstitutional. The check on that is that Congress can then change the law 
uh, to match the concerns the Supreme Court has and pass a new law designed to accomplish the same things, but addresses, again, the concerns that the Supreme Court has. Congress has to check on what the president does because they can override the veto that the president would, might have. And they have to balance those things out. So that's kind of why we have these three different branches of government, the checks and balances, the separation of power among the three, each having distinction, distinct responsibilities and areas of responsibility, certain things they have to do. And that's important for this notion of a too strong a central government. The one that's in some ways most directly related um, to this idea of consent of the governed would be Congress. In this country, we have what's known as a representative democracy, as opposed to a direct democracy. In a direct democracy, everybody votes on everything. All those eligible to vote or have the opportunity to vote on every issue. Obviously, that's too many issues. And when you have the number of people that we have, it would be a much too cumbersome process. So we elect representatives to represent our interests. And they then go into the Congress, and that provides the link. As we read through the first section last week, we understand that in the formation of the Constitution, there were two major uh, challenges they had to face, uh, which are reflected in Congress. The first is representation. The larger states wanted representation to be based on population. The smaller states wanted to have a greater sense of equal representation. So we had the Great Compromise that provided for a bicameral legislature, meaning two houses. We have a Senate, which every state has two, two senators. And then we have a House of Representatives, which are based on population. And every 10 years, when we go through the census, uh, lines are redrawn and members of Congress are redistributed among states based on population shifts. Some states gain representation, other states lose representation. But again, that's how we have direct input. For the person that gets elected, your book goes into detail on all of these topics. <clears throat> the decision is how are they going to view their role as a representative? There are basically three approaches to this idea of representation. The first is what's known as a delegate. You go there to represent the interest of your constituents and put you in office. As elections get closer and closer, and sometimes you may win by less than a percent or two percent, uh, who do you represent? And if you only represent those people that vote for you, then who represents those that didn't vote for you? And so the challenge of the delegate on the one hand, yes, I elected my representative to go and do what I would do and do what he told us during the campaign. Uh, but the other side of that is that who is left out of that representative if they're simply there as a delegate from there. The other role that is oftentimes played is that of a trustee, where you elect someone and you expect them to go and make the decisions that are best for not only their district, but the state and the nation. Oh. The third is what's known as a politico. And your text doesn't talk, talk quite as much about this. But the politico is basically the one that goes back and forth between those two, understands a political environment. Uh, sometimes a representative will have to vote against a bill, uh, not because they don't believe in the bill, but because their constituents don't want it to pass. Uh, oftentimes that's done in, in discussion with the leadership within the party, uh, especially if it's going to be a close vote, can they afford to lose a vote and understanding the symbolic nature? And that goes back to this idea of representation. We know that members of the House of Representatives are elected every two years. Uh, members of the Senate are elected for six-year terms, but one-third are re-elected every two years. So we have rotation in office. We'll talk about powers of the incumbency when we talk about elections in the coming week. But that's the basic structure of it. The Constitution also provides you specific criteria for running for a member of Congress, age, citizenship, things of those nature. What we do have, again, a similarity to the House of Commons and the House of Lords that was prevalent in England uh, during the colonial period. The House of Lords representing a smaller group of the population, the House of Commons representing the general public. The way we structure it in, in our system of government is all bills relating to funding generation of funds and things have to be originated in the House of Representatives, basically because the theory is they're closer, there are more of them, they have a district focus rather than a statewide focus, and then they'll be better able to understand the issues and concerns of their constituency. 
The Senate, when, which has equal representation, has a different set of responsibilities. And among those are working with the president for advice and consent, for cabinet appointees, for treaties, for Supreme Court justices, things of that nature. So that, again, becomes another check, if you will, on the power of the presidency. The fact that they have to run a lot of their senior appointees through the Senate to get their advice and consent. And you've noticed, if you follow the news, the, the challenges of, of having hearings, the challenges of getting through the process, especially as we become more polarized. One of the issues that's involved in government at this stage is what's the difference between unified and divided government. And the basic difference between unified and divided government is if one party controls both the presidency and both houses in Congress, uh, that's considered unified government. Uh, the good news of unified government is it makes it much easier for the party in power to get their policies enacted and implemented. Uh, the downside is it oftentimes can leave the other party with little input into the process. Divided is when one of those three branches is from a different party. Uh, and then you have conflict. We have had, that's been the more the norm in the past several uh, Congresses uh, than in the past. So here we have a situation where the president currently is a Democrat. The Senate is controlled by the Democrats with simply a one vote majority, uh, which makes it difficult to get things done. And the House of Representatives is controlled by the Republican Party. So you see the challenge that come up in government and issues like funding for Ukraine and issues such as abortion and privacy rights and issues such as funding for Ukraine. And you see the differences and the distinctions and the challenges. And now currently we're having the challenge of the debt ceiling coming up on the 19th of January, I believe is when the action has to be taken. Because you have different parties that have different fiscal um, ideas about how government should be run. And so it becomes a lot more negotiation again between the, the Congress and the president. Again, checks and balances at work. And so when we look at stagnation, uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, that depends on where you sit. Some would suggest that it was back to this notion that the founders would rather see one bad law of uh, uh, nine good laws not be passed if it prevents one bad law from being passed. So in some ways, this law jam, if you will, this conflict, if you will, was written into the system because we're representing the interest of an increasing diverse population. And that makes it a bit of a challenge as we move forward. When you look at the PowerPoint, those are talking points that will highlight some of the things on which to focus. But again, as you read about Congress, make sure you focus on this idea of natural rights. Government gets its power from the consent of the people. And too strong a central government was not something that was wanted by the founding fathers as they move forward. The presidency is a chief executive, and the executive is overall leadership. They are both the physical leader, the actual leader of the country, and also the symbolic leader. They also have a role in party politics, and they are by distinction uh, the head of their party. So that makes it a complex situation to be in. They not only have to deal with day-to-day -day policy issues, international crises, but also from a symbolic point of view, they're expected to go out in the public. And when there's a disaster show up, uh, when there's a humanitarian issue, be there to talk about it and show support in the country from that symbolic perspective. The president is elected for a four-year term and is limited by the uh, uh, Constitution uh, to two terms. Uh, there's been one president that served three, Franklin Roosevelt, and shortly after that, the Constitution was amended to limit it to two. The practice of two terms was established actually by George Washington. Uh, when he had finished two terms, he was offered to, to have a third, and his concern was that that power would become too much like a king or a monarch. So he said, no, two is enough. Then keep in mind at the time, the idea of a political politician uh, or a professional politician uh, was not something that was thought of. You would come do your service and then go back to your, to your family, to your community to serve. And then we'll talk about that again next week when we talk about parties and moving forward. So the president has a lot of responsibility. Uh, sometimes when we talk about the branches of government, they, some text will include a fourth branch, although not included in the Constitution, uh, of the bureaucracy, which is an extension of the executive branch, because the executive is tasked with implementation of the policies that are put forward by Congress. What we find when we study the presidency is they get a lot more credit than they deserve, a lot more blame than they deserve. 
we all are concerned about inflation and high rates of inflation, and we want the president to do something about it. But how many of us have looked at the stock market and seen the profit margins of oil companies, of food processing companies? Uh, to what extent is that a function of inflation? Or is it a cause of inflation, this idea of raising prices beyond what's necessary? Uh, for oil prices, for instance, we generate right now, if I read the paper the other day, a record amount of oil being produced. The challenge is that we sell it on an international market. Uh, and so we sell it for what the market bears, and that causes some of the fluctuation. That's entrepreneurial, that's free market in essence. But again, what role do they play in the challenges of inflation? And yes, government policy is important. All of those things add into it. Uh, but again, it's much more complex. They also get more credit. Historically, we look back and think about the wonderful work that John Kennedy did uh, in the 1960s, when in fact, most of the civil rights activity was the result of his vice president, then to become president, Lyndon Johnson. Um, so again, understanding how the limits of what the president's power is, uh, but it becomes a good focal point for challenge. And you'll see that more and more as we enter this 2024 election season uh, with challenges to the president. One of the challenges that the president has is they have a record. And it's easy to pick and, and choose one or two issues and make that the focus of your campaign when in fact you may not have a record that you have to defend. The other issue that the presidency deal with is by limiting it to two terms, uh, when they're in the last two, one or two years of their second term, um, the opposition party has less interest in supporting and moving forward. They start looking at the election that's coming up. Both parties do that. It's just the nature of being a lame duck uh, because you're not gonna run for an election, you're gone. And then the, the strategy becomes, how can we get my party to remain in power or get the out party to gain power in the process? So that becomes a bit of a challenge moving forward. <clears throat> and what happens in that case and why this nature of the relationship between Congress and the president is to be important, the last year of President Obama's office, he wanted to appoint a, a person to fill a vacancy on the Supreme Court. Uh, the Republicans at the time uh, argued, no, we can't because there's an election coming up. Lindsey Graham from South Carolina was one of the leading proponents of this movement. Um, no, we can't appoint them. We need to wait to see the outcome of the election uh, before we appoint somebody. And in fact, refused to even give a hearing to the president's nominee. And one of the arguments made by the leadership in Congress is that we're required to have advice and consent, but it doesn't say we have to give a hearing just because you've nominated someone. Move ahead four years, the last several months of the Trump administration, there's a vacancy on the Supreme Court. And that logic that we can't fill a position because there's election close was thrown out the window so they could appoint another conservative uh, member to the Supreme Court. This just happened to be Democrat and Republican. And we go back and look during the, the, the World War II period and the New Deal under Franklin Roosevelt, he tried to change the rules concerning how many people were on the Supreme Court because he didn't feel he was getting adequate support. So the court packing, that was rejected. But again, it's not a partisan thing. It's just the way politics works. And uh, this time it just happened to be the Republicans in another, in another environment, it may be the Democrats doing the same thing. But that's the nature of how political things have become. And it goes back to the warning from George Washington when he left office about the downside of having partisan politics, where loyalty would be to the party rather than to the country and to the people. And some would argue that that's one of the challenges that we have today in dealing with the, the law jam that we have in Congress. So as you read through, look at those issues of the presidency, it talks about the evolution of the presidency, uh, talks about the powers. Um, one of the discussions that's, that's in the text that's an important one to look at is the whole idea of War Powers Act. Um, Congress has the only one that has authority to declare war, and we haven't declared war since the World War II, but yet we've been involved in conflict internationally almost all the time since then. First Korea, and then Vietnam, then the period of the Cold War, and recently the war on terrorism. What's happened in that process to the, give the president more flexibility was a War Powers Act, which gave them independent authority to commit troops uh, with notification requirements to Congress. Uh, some would suggest that that's a good way to address the changing environment of war and international conflict uh, by giving power to the president to do those things with some checks. 
Others would argue that that's Congress abrogating its responsibility in terms of the conduct of war and declaration of war. Uh, again, those debates take place all the time, and that's a challenge of American democracy. And that's why understanding those two founding principles is very important because it helps explain why we are where we are today. And the question then becomes, how true are we to that original content? The third area we talk about are the courts. Uh, we will not be talking about state level courts. We'll only be talking about national level, which is the Supreme Court. The responsibilities are spelled out in the constitution. Um, but nowhere in spelling out those responsibilities is a talk about this thing called judicial review. What it does say is that this constitution and laws made in accordance with it are the supreme law of the land. In the, in the famous case of Marbury versus Madison, Congress, or the court, uh, asserted its right for judicial review, saying we're the ones that need to determine whether laws are passed in accordance with the Constitution. Again, the check on that is Congress can go back and change the law to address the concerns that the court has. So that's an example of a law of a, of a power not specifically listed in the Constitution uh, that the Supreme Court gave to itself. <coughs> Excuse me. And what's important is understand they have no enforcement mechanism. They rely on the president and the Congress to support their actions in that case. And oftentimes they go against public opinion uh, because it's a legal correct thing to do. Other times they go with public opinion uh, because uh, politics gets involved. And as much as we would like to think the Supreme Court is apolitical, the whole process of appointment and confirmation becomes a political debate that takes place. That's why you have the shift from conservative to liberal and it's important thing to understand from the Supreme Court perspective is they serve basically for life. And, and they, their influence will outlive whatever party was in power when they were nominated and appointed to the Supreme Court. There are nine justices. The process is talked about in your text at great length about how they accept cases, uh, how they assign cases, uh, the hearings that they have, and the limits to their authority. Predominantly, the Supreme Court says that they will not get involved in political, purely political decisions. So, for instance, one of the challenges that's come before the Supreme Court lately um, is redistricting and gerrymandering, which is a way of redrawing lines to favor the party that's in power at the time that they're redrawn to maintain their support uh, within the state. That's been challenged several times recently because it's based on political considerations, not on representative relationships, such as, as demographics and things of that nature. So what they're saying is that in some of these cases, they were done from a racial separation so that they could put minorities basically in one district and therefore limit their influence across the board. Gerrymandering is a term that's talked about in um, the section on Congress, and we'll talk about it when we come to elections as well. The Supreme Court refused to hear those cases, saying that that's a political decision that has to be decided by Congress and the individual states. But then what about decisions on the election for the president? Is that a political choice? Well, they stepped in when Al Gore was running against uh, Bush uh, in 1990. The challenge was in Florida with the hanging chads and the challenge with counting votes, the Supreme Court stepped in, eliminated or stopped the re recounts. And basically by that decision, Bush won the, won the uh, election. Uh, excuse me, it was 1996. Excuse me. Anyway, uh, won the election because the Supreme Court intervened. We now have that challenge going on with former President Trump uh, in the courts challenging uh, his right uh, to run for office. The 14th Amendment says no candidate who's been involved in insurrection uh, can hold office. And so the December, the January 6th events are considered by many to have been an insurrection. Um, part of Trump's argument is that he was not impeached, was not found guilty by the Senate, and therefore he's immune from prosecution. The other argument is that the way that we've handled impeachment lately is just much more partisan issue. You saw that with Bill Clinton, and you saw that with President Trump. So one of the challenges that he's saying is that basically, unless he's uh, 
found guilty of something by the Senate, he has immunity from any actions he takes while in office. What do you think? Should the president be immune? And as a matter of fact, one of the questions one of the judges asked during the hearing was that then based on that interpretation, if the president were to allow Team Steel Team 6 to go and assassinate a political rival, would he be immune from prosecution? And the response was, unless they're convicted in the Senate, um, no, he wouldn't be. Is that the way we want to have it? Do we want to have a president who's above the law, who has no accountability, especially today when the whole process of impeachment has become much more political in nature, challenges that take place. And so those are kind of the ongoing issues with all branches of, of government, uh, with the role of politics, the increasing role of partisanship, the increasing polarization that we have among the citizens over what's the correct course of action. Mm -hmm. To what extent uh, do those considerations, to what extent do we have minority rule in so many states? And by minority rule, meaning that the person who won didn't necessarily win all the majority of votes, uh, have to have a runoff and then they get involved and win by small majorities. Uh, those become challenges we have to look at it. So as you go back and read, pay attention to the PowerPoints that are out there that talk about each branch. Use that as a guide for your reading and understanding. Uh, use those as a guide for the way you respond to the question posted in the discussion forum. <clears throat> but as always, keep in mind and try to link your responses to this notion of our two underlying principles, which are first, government derives its just power from the consent of the people, which is natural law. And the fear of too strong a central government, which was spelled out in our Declaration of Independence, our grievances. I'll be converting this and posting it on my YouTube channel. I will send an email out with the link when it's available. Uh, should be within the next day or so uh, for those who are not able to attend. If you have any questions, by all means, contact me. Uh, let me know what you need, uh, questions you have, challenges that you might have, and I'll get back as soon as possible. I uh, do check my email, as I said earlier, several times a day, uh, but a minimum once a day, so please contact me. And that's especially true with the assignments that are coming up. Um, as I said early on, I accept late work, but unless we've made prior arrangements, uh, you lose one letter grade for each day that it's late. So I hope you have a good week. If you have questions on the readings or the assignments, please contact me, and we will see you next Tuesday morning. Uh, the invitation uh, will be sent out uh, today. And so you should have it in access. So good luck with your readings. Uh, let me know if you have questions and we'll talk next week. Have a great day. Bye-bye.